Welcome to the 2021 Tradition of Excellence Assembly. In order to show respect and give our undivided attention to our honorees, please take a moment and make sure your phones are off and away during the video. At this time, I would like to introduce OPRF Jr. Isabel Najera, who will be singing our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we The Tradition of Excellence Award was established by the class of 1982 in order to recognize distinguished alumni who have made outstanding contributions to society through personal and professional pursuits. During this time, more than 100 alumni have received this award. Nominations are always accepted, and once someone is nominated, they are continually considered until they win. You can visit the school website for information to nominate others as well as to read about previous winners. As you listen to the success stories of the winners today, remember that you could be up on this stage someday to accept this award. The Tradition of Excellence Selection Committee included Student Council Sponsor, Ms. Katie Prendergast, Board of Education Representative, Dr. Marianne Mohanraj, and Student Officers in Student Council. The committee was driven by the Student Council Officers who research the nominees, recommend the award winners, and create today's presentation. At this time, I would like to introduce you to two of our student council officers, Hallie Rigdon and Maeve McAndrews. Hi Huskies, my name is Hallie Rigdon and I'm the student council board representative. Um, I am here with Maeve McAndrews, the student council senior liaison. Today we will be honoring the 2020 Tradition of Excellence Award recipient, Dr. Kiona Allen. Dr. Allen truly embodies OPRF's motto, those things that are best, with her inspiring work in children's pediatric cardiology. Dr. Allen graduated from OPRF in 2000. While here, she was a four-year varsity gymnast and a captain and participated in the yearbook. The classes she most enjoyed during her time at OPRF were philosophy and IP biology. She remembers her teachers expecting greatness from her, which gave her the self-confidence to be successful in high school and in her future career. After graduating from OPRF, Dr. Allen completed her undergraduate degree in medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. While there, she started their intercollegiate gymnastics club team. Following her years at the University of Pennsylvania, she attended the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine to complete her pediatrics residency. She decided to return to Philadelphia to complete her specialized training in pediatric cardiology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Allen moved back to Chicago to complete her fellowship in pediatric critical care medicine. She currently resides in Chicago and practices as, as an attending physician in pediatric cardiology at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. She is proud of the success she has been able to achieve, but more so the children and family her work affects. Her passion for working with children goes beyond the hospital as she coaches at TriStar Gymnastics once a week. Dr. Allen's dedication to bettering the lives of so many is truly remarkable and admirable. We are so proud of our OPRF alum. We look forward to seeing her continued success and contributions to the medical field in the years to come. OPRF is thrilled to present Dr. Kiona Allen with the OPRF Tradition of Excellence Award. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of today's event. I grew up right here in Oak Park. 
My parents, now retired, were both teachers in the local schools. My dad right-haired OPRF as a head basketball coach, assistant football coach, and a math teacher for over 30 years. While he loved being a coach, my dad had a passion for teaching math, particularly to students who struggled. He'd go in before school and stay long after practice to help his students, many of them also players on his team, get the extra help they needed. For him, it was more than a job, it was a calling. And his students responded to that passion and rose to the occasion. My mom, now a retired elementary school administrator, still coaches gymnastics 10 minutes from here with the same passion. She believes that the impact she can have on the lives of children is her calling. Many of her students are your current and former classmates, and she believes that the lessons they've learned through the hard work and dedication required to be a gymnast is the reason for their success later in life. Together, my parents taught me to have a purpose and to approach that purpose with a deep passion, not to just go to work. It needs to mean something. And I've tried to live that every day on the road to where I am now. And I continue to try to live it every day as I do my best to inspire the medical team I supervise, my patients and their families. My time at OPRF set the stage for what was to come. As a four-year varsity gymnast, I certainly learned the value of putting your head down and working hard, even when everyone else is off having fun or when it seems really difficult. The encouragement I received from my teachers, my coaches, and my dean, and the expectations they set for me were the fuel that I needed to get done the things that I've done. They taught me to dream big, which led me to leave home for the University of Pennsylvania to make sure I could get myself the best medical training out there. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to go to Penn for undergraduate and medical school. I worked hard to have the grades, the extracurriculars and the scholarship money that would get me in the door, but that's not enough to keep you there. Fortunately, the education I got at OPRF helped me to hold my own against kids from the fanciest and most expensive private boarding schools out there. The connections I made there have opened innumerable doors for me in and out of medicine that have helped me to become a national leader within my field. While at Penn, I actively sought out connections that would help me pursue my growing passion for the care of children with complex and critical cardiac disease. These connections open the door to local leadership positions, national committees, research opportunities, publications, and future job offers. I'm now considered to be a national expert in the care of these very complex and fragile patients both in the hospital and in the long-term once they get discharged home. But above all else, I always come back to what I learned from my parents and here at OPRF. It's important to remember why I do what I do. What brings me back day after day, even when it's hard or sad or frustrating? It can be a little hard to imagine the life of a pediatric cardiac intensive care physician, but I think Opal and her mom can explain it better than I can. Opal got sick very suddenly. She wasn't always a sick kid. A pediatrician found a slow heart rate in her at a random checkup and sent us to a cardiologist. And the cardiologist basically was like, you are not stopping home. You're not getting your bags. You're going down at Lurie's Children's. It's a shock to like go from normal everyday life and then all of a sudden you're in a hospital and you're needing all of these things that you can't wrap your head around. Within six months, she arrested at home in December. I had to lay her down and begin CPR myself for about four minutes before the paramedics got there. And that sudden arrest basically airlifted us to Lurie Children's. But the minute she got into her room, she lost her pulse and coded again. From that point on, we knew that we we're gonna be here for a while, so. doctor comes in and she says, we have a machine called the Berlin. It will get her to transplant, we hope. It's not the best solution, but it's the only solution we have. It basically acts as an outside chamber of the heart. It allows the lungs still to do their job and to, to work so they don't have to be intubated. They can return to activities such as eating and, you know, playing and interacting. Without the Berlin heart, a boy wouldn't be here today. When you're waiting as an organ recipient, you don't know what your wait time is gonna be. It could be five days, it could be a year. And so it gave her the best chances. 
it's a hard prayer to pray for. You have to know that it's coming with a cost of another family making a really brave decision. She waited for 130 days. The doctors came in just like a normal, like they would be coming in to do their normal checkup. And the doctor says, we've accepted an offer for Opal for a heart. We're in such disbelief that they were basically like, it's hers, it's hers and she's going tomorrow for surgery. Larry Children's is amazing. It's a second family to us. The people that you meet here, the stories, the families, and the children that you see, it will change your life forever. You don't know until you've lived on the floor and you could live there for one day or you could live there for six months like we did and you'll be forever changed. There's not a, a price for it. There's not a word for it. It's invaluable. And that's what I keep coming back to. This work can be incredibly challenging. But the celebrations in between the hard moments to make the journey you get here and the daily hard work more than worth it. I'm so grateful to OPRF and to my parents for starting me down the path to this incredible life. I hope that as you find your own way, own way forward as young adults, you can find something that brings you as much joy as my career, my patients, and my families have brought to me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zen Philpotts. I'm your student council president. And I'm Josie Humbert, your student council vice president. First and foremost, we are extremely grateful that we, had the, that we are fortunate enough to play a role in the 2021 Tradition of Excellence Ceremony. It is unfortunate that we had to postpone last year, but let's say thanks to how lucky we are to have it today. And today we'll be honoring Nathan Dudley, or as he likes to be called, Just Nate. Our time with him provided us with a thorough understanding of everything that this man stands for. Not only did this time give us more than enough to know that Nate is fantastic, that is a fantastic man deserving of this award a hundred times over, but this passion that he, the, the, his passion really stuck with us. From being a valedictorian of his class to being a three-star part, a three-star athlete to his, his career today, it was clear that he is determined to make a change. Through his career, which began after undergraduate after having an undergraduate degree from Yale University, he went on to the television industry in a brief stint with sports marketing, but he later found his passion with teaching and began working for the Chicago schools. After he outgrew his passion there, a position there, he brought his talent to the New York school system. From his arrival in New York, Nate immediately made his mark. He became the principal of a first of its kind institution, the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. This school was a part of a bigger project, the disbanding of larger underperforming schools to be replaced with more personalized ones in efforts to bridge the ever increasing gap. At this school, he drew on his experiences of hands-on learning from his OPRF law classes to give these kids a revolutionary education. This includes sampling and measuring water quality, attending lectures on marine science and river history, and learning to sail. He is part of an even more impressive feat, the growing of one billion oysters in the New York City Harbor. After his decade on Governor's Island, he found his place as a teacher of the teachers, a field support liaison. He now resides in Manhattan and follows his past classmates in OPRF on social media. He continues to inspire the generations of the future in hopes of saving the earth and to leave his mark on this world. His advice to current students when choosing their career path is to find something you're passionate about and to live within that passion as much as you can. We are honored to present Mr. Dudley with this award. Hello, my name is Nate Dudley, class of 1978 from OPRF. 1978. Whoa. Think of it this way. When some of you are making one of these videos someday because you're about to be honored on the tradition of excellence wall, then you'll be making that video in the year 2064. So yeah, it's been a minute since I was there. But before you turn off from just the other old white guy gonna be up on the wall, I'd like to tell you a little story about my Oak Park experience and some of what it's meant to me in my life. Because once upon a time, I did really sit right there where you're sitting. So thanks for listening. This is me in 1974, my ID at Lane Tech as a freshman, looking straight out of the movie Dazed and Confused, if you've seen that. Well, I moved to Oak Park as a sophomore. The school heard that I was coming, my name was Nate, and that I played football. So I think they assumed I was going to be black. Even though I'd been in honors classes at Lane Tech and I did really well, the program I was given when I got to Oak Park was for 
regular track classes. My mom marched me into the guidance office and told them, you put him in honors classes, and if he can't handle it, then you change him back. You know how it is when you're 15 and you don't want your mom making a fuss for you? I was so embarrassed. They changed my classes, maybe thanks to some white privilege at work. But that day, I also decided I had to prove something to this school, to these people that had made some assumptions about me, and I wanted to take advantage of all the opportunities that this school had to offer. Sophomore year, I had a chip on my shoulder, but I started to plug into stuff. My sister and I wrote a few newspaper articles for trapeze that made the administration not so happy, like this one on student gambling on college and NFL games that was illegal at the time, and it led to a big police bust uh, in a neighboring suburb. Or this one on student PCP, what we called angel dust, drug use at the time. But we were learning the skills of good journalism and keeping it real. I played football, I wrestled, and I played baseball for my three years at Oak Park. And I learned so much from those experiences. Teammates and coaches can teach us as much about leadership, about life and ourselves, as any subject we take in the classroom. And I value the opportunity that I received by being able to play those sports at OPRF. When I was a junior, my American history cl class created a courtroom trial where four classes participated. Our class played the role of lawyers and witnesses. A law class was the judge and jury. The TV class covered the trial with those clunky giant video cameras from back in the day. And the journalism class wrote stories and covered the proceedings. When I became a high school teacher later on in my life, and later a principal, that experience of putting on that trial gave me a much greater understanding of the power of teachers and students working together towards a common goal across classes and subjects. So much real learning can take place there. I still remember that class 44 years ago. From these experiences, I want to leave you with two main ideas of what I learned from OPRF. First, Remember that intelligence is equally distributed across all people, but opportunity is not equally distributed in our society. For example, at Lane Tech, the biggest school in Chicago, our freshman football team had 90 players and one coach. But when I got to Oak Park, there were three freshman football teams with three coaches each. As an educator in my life, my work has been to create more equitable opportunities for all students. Here I am as a teacher with some of my students from the Bronx lobbying a New York State Senator in Albany. In 2003, I created and became the founding principal of the New York Harbor School, a public high school on Governor's Island off the tip of Manhattan that students have to take a ferry to get to every day. We sail, row, swim, boat, build boats, scuba, and grow oysters as part of the Billion Oyster Project to restore the water quality of New York Harbor. The Harbor School prepares students for college opportunities, but also for the opportunity to learn skills on the water, the opportunity to restore our local environment, and the students become environmental leaders in this work. So a big life lesson for me that began in Oak Park is, if you live your life to create opportunities and to provide more equitable opportunities for everyone, and I mean everyone, then you'll be living a good life. By the end of my three years at Oak Park, I had a wide variety of friends and experiences. And yes, you may be embarrassed someday by your prom outfit, like this one. But from these experiences come the second big takeaway I want to leave you with today is the idea of what's called a public good. Oak Park is a public school paid for by your parents' tax dollars. It's not perfect. No school is. And you should make your voice heard when it's not. But the school does offer more opportunities to do more different things than most schools in the country, whether you realize that or not. So take advantage of those opportunities while you're in this school, which are paid for by the public. So I urge you to value what you have in a good public school, even when it's not perfect, and to lead lives that maintain the public good. I hope that when one of you is making your wall of excellence video like this in the year 2064, that OPRF is still working to provide equitable opportunities for learning and for skill building and for developing students' passions, even in things that haven't been invented right now, but will be invented by then. Thank you to the board and to the school for this honor of being on the traditional tradition of excellence wall. Now, you, your turn. Go out into the world and create opportunities to fight for the public good. Thank you. 
Hello everyone, my name is Wami Ashikanlu and I'm the Secretary of Student Council. This is Zeta Ahmed and she is the Service Project Coordinator of Student Council. One of the other highly accomplished OPRF alumni we are honoring this year is the late Dr. Charles Chuck Kramer. His incredibly kind son, Chip Kramer, offered his time to inform us on his father's incredible accomplishments. While dedicated and passionate for his work, Dr. Kramer was a funny, generous, kind, and incredibly intelligent man with an encyclopedic mind, as well as a loving father of six. After growing up in the Oak Park and River Forest area, Dr. Kramer felt deeply rooted in the community and moved into a house on Kenilworth for over 40 years. He did move around a few times in Illinois and ultimately retired in Ann Arbor, Michigan. However, Oak Park and River Forest was always his home. During his time at OPRF, Dr. Kramer was very active, running track, participating in various clubs, playing the upright bass and piano, um, and part playing in a popular dance band. Dr. Kramer continued playing music later in life and also grew a liking to sailboats, owning three of his own. Dr. Kramer also had a love for reading, which turned into him writing several books. Dr. Kramer was incredibly vital in the implementation of family therapy and psychotherapy in the early 1960s. He first discovered his passion in medical school at Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago while taking a psychology class. This was reignited whilst being a captain in the U.S. Air Force during the Korean War after seeing several of his fellow so soldiers returning with psychological trauma and suffering from PTSD. Dr. Kramer and his wife opened the Plum Grove Nursing Home and worked together to implement an actively state uh, stimulating community. Most notably, he founded the Family Institute, now affiliated with Northwestern University, which was started right in his um, home in Oak Park. The Family Institute was one of the first facilities that trained therapists in family therapy and the systematic aspect of mental health. Dr. Kramer and his wife saw couples and families, taught courses and wrote articles, and even published books on the topics of juvenile therapy, couples therapy, family therapy, and how they are all intertwined. Dr. Kramer retired in 1994 and unfortunately passed away in April of 2002. However, his work for the field of psychology still lives beyond him, and we are incredibly excited to present this Tradition of Excellence Award. My father was born in 1922 in Oak Park, and he was raised in River Forest. His father was Charles Henry Kramer I, and he was known as Henry. My father was Charles Henry Kramer Jr. He was known as Chuck, and I'm Charles Henry Kramer III. I've always been known as Chip. Chuck attended Oak Park River Forest High School from 1936 to 1940. His mother, Martha, attended high school there at your school and graduated in 1919. Chuck's sister, Gloria, also attended Oak Park River Forest High School and graduated in 1947. In addition to this, all six of Chuck's children attended Oak Park River Forest High School and graduated between 1964 and 1974. I graduated in 1970. During high school, Chuck was an athlete who ran track, specializing in the 440-yard hurdles during his sophomore and junior years. He was also a member of the Monogram Club, the Newton Club, and a Math Club. Although he made honor roll several semesters during his high school career, his academic performance was average. And he had his share of teacher's comments like, capable of much better work, careless about written work, not much effort. Chuck will no longer receive credit for any tardy work, carelessness about small tasks, and poor class work. So keep in mind that the performance in high school is not always an accurate predictor of success in life. Chuck's decision to become a doctor at age 13, when he woke up to his father having an epileptic fit on the bathroom floor. Chuck thought that it was his fault because four years earlier, his father fell off a ladder and broke his back when Chuck thought that he should have been helping him, his father. He decided to become a doctor to cure his father's disease. 
This conflict drove him his whole life. Chuck received undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Illinois. His interest in mental health was expressed in medical school in a letter to his girlfriend, soon to be his wife. Chuck began his medical practice as a family doctor in Palatine, Illinois, and then discovered psychiatry while serving in the Air Force during the Korean War. His experiences and training in child and adult psychiatry led him over time to an understanding of family systems. He became a pioneer in the emerging field of family therapy in the late 1950s, eventually founding the Family Institute of Chicago in his Oak Park home in 1968. The Family Institute grew and later was affiliated with Northwestern University where he became a professor of psych psychiatry. The Family Institute still stands today, has its own building on the Northwest campus, on the Northwestern campus, and offers a master's degree in marital and family therapy. Chuck and his loving wife and professional partner, Jan, were both recognized leaders in family therapy. Together, they spent over 20 years seeing couples, families, teaching courses, leading workshops around the country, writing many articles, and seven books. In addition, for 30 years, Chuck and Jan were owned and managed the Plum Grove Nursing Home in Palatine, Illinois, becoming national experts in geriatric care. They contributed innovative practices to the field, wrote numerous articles, and an award-winning book. Throughout his long and productive life, Chuck loved music, playing piano and string bass in dance bands while in high school and in college. He was an athlete who played tennis, loved to sail on Lake Michigan. Chuck was also an avid bowler, especially later in his life when he had his highest averages, winning senior tournaments, including the Michigan Senior Olympics several times, and even bowling a 300 point game. In 1994, Chuck and Jan retired and moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. During the second half of his life, Chuck had a spiritual awakening, which led him to explore all kinds of religious paths and bypaths. He and Jan went to retreats, read voraciously, as always, and challenged themselves to search for answers hidden both inside and outside the box. Life led him to an even more heartfelt devotion to his family and dear friends. Chuck died peacefully in his home at age 79 in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2002, leaving behind nine grandchildren. Good morning, Huskies. I am Linda Parker, your Assistant Superintendent Principal. Please join me in giving one more round of applause to all of our 2021 Tradition of Excellence honorees. I also want to thank you for your attention and participation today as we continue to celebrate this time-honored tradition. This morning, you have heard from three outstanding and impactful individuals who once sat in the same classrooms and walked the same hallways as you are today. I'd ask you to take a moment to reflect on that very fact and the significant legacy that exists here at Oak Park and River Forest High School. And know that one day we expect to be honoring you on this stage. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful day. At this time, please wait for the bell to ring and you will be transitioning to your third period class. And remember, it's a great day to be a Husky. <laughs>